Welcome to the Ink to Film Podcast, where we read the book and then see the movie. I'm Luke. And I'm James. And this week we discuss John McTiernan's 1988 modern Christmas classic, Die Hard. Welcome to the party, pal. holidays and merry christmas welcome to our christmas episode here we we just finished reading and watching die hard and it's been a it's really put me in the christmas spirit how about you yippee ki yay motherfucker <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean uh it's a, it's a holiday classic for me i watch it almost every year watching it i don't know about you but watching it as a podcast uh you know taking notes for the podcast was a whole different experience and and i'm excited to talk about it yeah definitely there's so much to talk about but before we get to that we have a special episode coming up yeah uh we're gonna be looking back at 2017 and revisiting some of our movies we've talked about and books and uh you know addressing audience questions that we may have not gotten to yeah uh we're gonna call it 2017 last looks so look out right, for that episode. A film term right yeah it's definitely on on set term that people use a lot So we'll be kind of going back over some of the stuff we've covered this year and anything that people have sent us in that we haven't been able to get to. So if you wanted to send us anything for that episode, we go ahead and send it because we will probably get to it because it's going to be an episode dedicated to that kind of thing. Yeah, and it doesn't matter if this is your first episode or you've listened to every single one. Like, we want to hear from you. Uh, Even if it's just, you know, uh, telling us that you enjoyed something, you know, tell us your favorite episode or something you particularly like that we did or ask us a question about the show going forward or about something we've done in the past i mean anything's fair game it's a special episode we're not going to be covering any particular topic um so we definitely would love to have something to talk about so please write in you listening right now (laughs) yeah all of you listening so you can send that to ink to film at gmail.com yeah or yeah or you can contact us on facebook or twitter or anything definitely so, Luke, this past week you went to PodCon, huh? How was that? PodCon was a lot of fun. Shout out to all the people I met that might be checking this out, or if they just happened to find one of the mini flyers I distributed uh, and, and are checking it out for that reason. You know, thank you for, for tuning in. Uh, I had a lot of fun at that convention. I, I, I am a huge McElroy Brother fan, and I went to all their live shows. Loved it. There's a lot of cool panels and, and a lot to discuss that I know that will affect uh, this podcast going forward because I, I learned a lot there and uh, you know hopefully they do it again next year because I'd love to go back. Yeah, it's cool. I saw lots of pictures and stuff. Pretty jealous. Hopefully I can go next year. Oh yeah, uh, that reminds me. So I my my friend Curtis Chen, who is a awesome sci-fi writer, uh, he has a couple of books out, Kangaroo, uh, Waypoint Kangaroo and Kangaroo 2, and they're both humorous spy thriller sci-fi novels that you should totally check out. Uh, he loaned me his copy of Die Hard, so that's how I was able to watch this movie. So big shout out to him. Thank you for that. Nice. Well, from there, I think it's probably time for us to jump into this. So Yeah, let's do it. Die Hard came out in 1988. John McTiernan directed. And did you, I, you actually were the one who told me to kind of look into the director. How much do you know of what his whole deal has been? So speaking of Curtis, he told me a very little bit and just enough to kind of alert me that something kind of odd happened with John in like his like the years following this movie. Um, but I really don't know a lot of it because I purposely didn't look into it because I thought it, uh, it would be cool to learn it, learn it from you. So what did you find out? OK, so to put this into perspective, um, the movies that he directed, 1987, he directed Predator. The following right. the following year, he directed Die Hard. The year after that, in 1989, he directed Hunt for Red October. Hmm. And then he had like another film or two. And then he directed Last Action Hero. And then he came back in 1995 to direct Die Hard with a Vengeance. Nice. I like that one too. So what's crazy about this is he kind of had like a little bit of a, a good lineup there going on, or at least fairly like highly praised action films in the 80s and early 90s. And 
what's crazy about this is apparently in, in the year 2000, he was filming some a movie called Rollerball. I don't know if you've seen that or not. Have you seen it? I I don't think so. Okay. Well, it's like a it's a remake and it's kind of like a sci-fi action type movie. So he during this process wiretapped one of his producers' phones and he was monitoring what they were talking about because I guess they were having disputes over like how the film was going to go and he wanted to like have the edge and be able to like push the movie in his direction. Because that's normal. <laughs> yeah, isn't this? This is wild. So he pleaded guilty to perjury and lying to an FBI officer, investigator, in regards to his hiring of the private investigator, uh, Anthony Pelicano, in late 2000. So he that he hired someone to do all of this stuff, but he still, oh, okay. you know what I mean? It was still him. Like, he told them to do it. So what's crazy is that over the next couple years, he was, I mean, not even couple, over the next, like, decade, he was in, in and out of courts trying to um he was pleading guilty and then saying like oh no i don't want to i he like fired his whole legal team hired a new one and said like no i don't i want to take back my guilty plea and lots of stuff went on but anyway he was incarcerated finally in april of 2013 and he had to any he, he was there from april 2013 to february 2014 and during his imprisonment he declared bankruptcy amidst foreclosure proceedings from his for his ranch residence that he had he struggled wow. to pay legal fees and IRS debt. Man, <laughs> that's pretty amazing. But so, so uh, one thing Curtis told me was that he is uh, now he's like he just did a commercial or something. Like he's like kind of trying to get back on the horse now. I guess. I I mean I believe it. He probably needs the money. But it's it's like uh, last film he completed I think was released in like two thousand three. Okay. Yeah. Whenever wow. he directs another film, maybe he'll be he'll be back. I saw pictures of him at like a couple uh, film festivals and that kind of thing. But it seems like he, I don't know if people want to work with him anymore or kind of how he's seen within the industry, but I have to assume if he was like wiretapping somebody he was working with, people are probably pretty skeptical. Wow, man. I mean, like in those movies you listed, like Predator, I mean, like these are some of the like iconic action movies of the late 80s, early 90s, right? Yeah, I mean, Hunt for Red October is another one. Like, Last, mm -hmm. Last Action Hero is pretty, I mean, it is what it is. I really like that movie. That's that's a fun movie. It's definitely, it's got, I, I think I have a little bit of nostalgia goggles for it, but I haven't seen sure, it in a long sure. time. Me too. I mean, it's Schwarzenegger, so there's kind of a, like, ceiling on how good it can really be. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's, he's, I love him, man. He's a bona fide movie star and all that, but. Well, that ceiling's probably Terminator and Terminator, Terminator 2, too, right? Yeah. That's the ceiling. <laughs> love that movie. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah he came back for die hard with the vengeance though which is the third die hard which i didn't even know so i figured we we could just jump into the movie here and just start talking about general thoughts and we'll jump into spoilers here in a little bit sure i was actually really like um looking at this movie to re to record a podcast about it i kind of want to look at the form of the film and like a lot of things that they decided to do and I know like a lot of action movies in the 80s were, were pretty kinetic, but this movie, I don't, I don't, there weren't many shots where the camera was still. There was constant camera movement, different angles. It was, it was a, I mean, it was really well crafted for, for this quick action film. And I think that's, that's part of the reason why it's still in such high standing today is because it was, it was well thought out, well crafted. What, what did you think about the movie just watching this time for the podcast? This is a movie for me that, is one of those movies that seems like it changes every time you watch it. But what is actually obviously changing is you, right? Like you, the viewer. And so every time I see it, I, I, I like notice different things, different things stand out to me as that I used to love that now don't land for me or that I always have loved and are still just as good. And this, this time that really stood out to me too. I think there is a lot of things, and we, and we can touch on them. But there's there's a lot of things that date this movie. Um, I don't I don't think it it handles its female characters particularly well, put to put it mildly. But I, you know, I'm still able to enjoy this movie, and I I don't want to dwell too much on that stuff. Um, just, just I just want to say that I am aware of it, and that I think it is a valid criticism of this movie. That you know. It's very bound up in machismo and the the, the kind of over-the-top male empowerment that is John McClane, right? Like, he is this, like, quintessential masculine figure. And because of that, there are there is a lot of things you can say on the flip side of that that aren't so nice. But um, 
I don't really want like I said I don't I, I, I'm willing to talk about it but I don't want to I don't want to be a downer like this is going to be a show where we talk about you know the things we liked about this movie right mostly yeah I mean like you said we do have to address that kind of thing and I definitely noticed that as well it's there's it doesn't handle women very well it doesn't handle people of color very well there's there's a lot of like things that are problematic within it and it's like if like it sucks to be like oh it's it's because it's of that time but like it just and it's it's such a bummer to like go back to these movies that i remember so fondly and see like i mean i've seen it a lot with with movies that i go back to that they are just like there there's certain social norms that go on that just weren't okay that and that... and we should we should say you know if it's not obvious uh we're a couple of white guys so we had the privilege of not having to worry about this stuff and we've we've chosen to be aware of it now um but you know, if you're a woman or a person of color and you saw this movie, you probably noticed it the first time you saw it. You know, I assume you did. And it's just I, we were able to ignore it. And I think, you know, it's something I'm constantly trying to make sure that I'm doing better of. Definitely. I agree. Oh, I did want to talk about. So in the, if you listen to our book episodes, we mentioned that Roderick Thorpe's novel. In the original, the, this is a sequel to his original novel called The Detective. And that and that movie was made into a film with starring Saint Tr- uh, Frank Sinatra, excuse me. And we both theorized that maybe he was imagining Frank Sinatra to be the actor who was going to play this in an, ev- an eventual film production, perhaps. And I we teased in the previous episodes that we should talk about what it would have been like with Frank Sinatra in this movie. What, do you want to take a stab at that? Yeah, I've just like from my from what I've seen and stuff of Frank Sinatra, the things that I think of are uh, singing and dancing. So I just assume there would have been more singing and dancing in Die Hard. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I haven't seen him as an actor. Like I assume that he had some chops. I don't know though. Maybe no. Maybe yeah, he, was he a terrible does. Actor. I, I was kidding. Does yeah, he? he he's no. He's fine. He's he's. There's a reason why he was as popular as he was. But I just like think it'd be hilarious to see uh, John McClane like singing going around singing or doing some sort of dance number yeah my my, i mean my take is pretty simple this movie wouldn't be what it is without bruce willis he is this movie his his personality his on-screen charisma he 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 brings such a iconic take to this character that redefined because he's not arnold schwarzenegger you know what i mean like he's he's a badass but he's more of an everyman in a lot of ways and you know, he's not a giant, you know, he's not the rock, you know, he's, he's, he's still kind of just like an average guy, but, but badass. Right. And I think, I mean, Bruce Willis was made, you know, to play this role. He really was. Yeah, I, I totally agree. What's funny is in my research and looking around and stuff, he up to this point was seen as a, like a comedic actor. So him taking on this role was kind of a big deal. And um, God, I guess changed the, his career, huh? Yeah, yeah. I mean, he how many he's done what five Die Hard movies now, and like he's like is that and character. a million other action movies, right? Yeah, where he's basically John McClane, but just in <laughs> yeah. on doing this, doing that. Um, but yeah, so he was like this comedic actor that decided to do this, and I guess Fox had a lot of the marketing didn't even show Bruce Willis leading up to the movie; they just showed like a, that it was going to be an action movie because people probably hmm. would have thought of it differently. So uh, one more thing I wanted to mention was the there's a lot of people in this movie and a lot of moments where it's just people doing cool stuff for the sake of doing cool stuff. Like, did you notice that on this viewing? Like, Like, okay, so like um, the terrorists first get to the building and one of the terrorists, rather than walking down the stairs, decides to like use his arms to like slide down the stairs or like instead of like exactly what scene you're talking about. (laughs) Yeah. So instead of instead of like cutting the wires, normally he gets a chainsaw and he like cuts through all of the phone wires all at the same time. And it's just like it works for the movie, but it's just like it's like it really serves no purpose other than people being like, that was that was pretty fucking cool, right? Okay, yes, but I actually wrote down both of those scenes because I think they do serve a purpose. Uh, so let me let me hit you with it, and you tell me if you think I'm I'm, I'm you know being accurate or not. Okay. So that both of those happen when the terrorists are first being introduced, and I love if you take the terrorists as a character. They are an awesome character. And they're one of the things that sets this movie apart from so many other movies like it. And, you know, the sliding down the stairs, that to me showed them as being athletic. Like cocky. Yeah. Co- being a little bit cocky, being assured in what they're doing, just like they know exactly what they're doing. They're doing it fast. They're doing it in a controlled manner. And then 
Carl, when he takes the chainsaw, it shows him from the jump to be out of control, a little bit unhinged, and he sh- it, like even the other terrorists are a little bit afraid of him. Now yeah. we like later learn that that's his brother, and I don't, but we don't know that in the moment that he does that too. But it's interesting because I think we we all look at him and go, okay, this guy's the like wild one, right? You identify him as the one that even the other terrorists are a little bit freaked out by. Yeah, I totally buy that. That's that's definitely a good point. They they are showing like that's it's the filmmaker showing that they're very capable. There are other examples where like they'll like throw keys to each other or like something and it's just like used as like this thing to show them. But like you said, they're confident. They know what they're doing. Yeah. So yeah, I totally they're confident. Buy that. They have cool. a plan. They're organized, capable, yeah. you know, all these things. Like that I will say that uh McTiernan uses a lot of these um like over the top seemingly over the top like motions and things that they do to motivate camera movement so like i said like there was a moment where like somebody threw keys and like the keys like the camera kind of follows the keys and goes to the next person and keeps and it keeps following that path route like the keys will stop at one person but it keeps pushing to the right and it'll like show what's going on outside or something and there's a lot of that which which i thought was really cool and like specifically there's a scene coming up that that i'll talk about when we get there that i really liked so yeah, let's go ahead and just jump into spoilers here. Uh, is there anything you want to say that's spoilerific that you want to just drop right off the top? Uh, yeah, uh, the we've talked about this at length, uh, ad nauseum, if you will, in our Blade Runner episodes. And oh no, the Thing episodes, I think, is where we really talked about it. We talked about CGI versus like practical effects, right? This movie is almost all, if not all, practical effects, for, yeah. to my knowledge, and. That's one of the reasons why I think it stands up like a champ, because when they explode things like they, that was a real explosion. They actually did like it, it all just looks great still. And yeah. the stunts that are done, like we're just real stuntmen doing crazy shit. So it looks really cool. Yeah, most of it really is real. And um, what the the building uh, Nakatomi Plaza is actually Fox Plaza. Like that building is like the Fox headquarters building. So like some of the That's shots, cool. the exterior shots were actually explosions going off out like they were, you know, moved a little bit so that they wouldn't actually go off on the building. But they were like, you know, it's Hollywood, Hollywood magic to sh- to make an explosion go off at the Fox building. And yeah. um, there's a couple of scenes and shots where like when they're on the roof and all that stuff, the the people like the Fox execs would give them like they're like, you have two hours to get this shot. So get it. And all kinds of stories like that that we'll get to, I'm sure. And I don't know, I, I, I don't know in your research if you found out how they pulled off some of the helicopter stuff, but I was amazed when I when I saw it. There's a scene where the helicopters in formation fly between high rises, like uh, right above street level, and just are like cutting and weaving in between high rises. It looked real. Like I was like, these are real helicopters doing this. Which seems incredibly dangerous. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I'm sure they probably shut down the streets or whatever they had to do, but that was definitely wild when they were when they were flying really low like that. There's a couple. There's a couple moments like the explosions that happen in the building. They used like lights. They would shoot really high powered lights, and what and then they would just like superimpose the explosion from another shot on top of mm-hmm. that to make the explosion look like it was exploding the building. So it's like even their special effects was all like very practically done. It was, there was no, you know, there's no CGI back then or if there That's was, cool. it was very like makeshift. And they didn't use it because right. I, I, I really didn't see any, at least none that stood out to me. I mean, there's, I was wondering about the scene where John jumps off the roof and it explodes behind him. And I couldn't tell if that was like, like how they did. Like, it seems like that was some sort of composite, but I wasn't hundred percent sure, yeah. sure. Probably. But either way, they it, it was done fairly practically, in my opinion. They, he definitely he definitely jumped off the building, it, or yeah. like a, a like a you know whether they it was a full building or just like a yeah constructed like little lip of the building to make it look like he was. Yeah. And and that I mean just to wax a little bit more about that, there's a, there, they pull back into the city, and they and you you're like it's like the view from the city looking up at this building, and you see the explosions going off on top of it. And they do this a couple times. There's that time, and then there's the time when, um, I think when he's shooting machine guns up there, like you can see little flashes of light atop the building. Yeah, yeah. From like the street level, like mm-hmm. those scenes are like those shots are so cool to me. Definitely, that's a cool shot. I like that one. So I guess I'll just run through this just in case you haven't seen the movie. I'm assuming or hoping that you see it before, but we're in full spoilers now, so we'll just tell you the story. Yeah, just for yeah, we'll keep it brief. The beginning uh, is basically the same 
uh, John lands in LA and we get the backstory from the limo driver. He shows up to the party where he meets Mr. Takagi and Ellis. And Ellis is doing like cocaine off of Holly's office desk and Holly shows up. John goes and gets cleaned up in, in her room or some spare room and he does the balling up of his, his toes, making fists like he did in the in the novel, which I am still kind of surprised that that was like straight up different. in the novel. Oh yeah, you're right. It's it's um what does he say in the in, novel? In the novel he he's just it's just washing your feet. Oh yeah, that's what it was. Yeah, the actual fist with your toes is a, that's a movie movie specific, I think. Yeah, which is also it's weird, right? <laughs> yeah. No, but like I, I I don't know about you, but have you ever done this? Have you ever tried this? No, no. no I'm gonna have to. I no. do. I totally do because <laughs> this is one of those weird details that sticks out in my mind. Like if I fly somewhere across the country to like a convention or something, and you I get there and I get into the into the room, I, s- I swear to God, I take off my shoes and I try and like kind of like rub the carpet with them a little bit and make fists. And it's like I don't know what it is. It does actually kind of feel good. I don't know. Nice. I'm trying it. I'm trying it next time I travel. It helps you like get grounded in your in the new space you're in. So John and, and Holly have a little argument and uh, she goes off to do something. And this is when Gruber and the terrorists show up at Nakatomi Plaza. And this this scene with the introduction of Alan Rickman's Gruber is is amazing. Like it's everything's low angles. Everything's in the shadows. It's in like the the bellows of the building. And there's smoke everywhere. It's super intimidating. They're cutting from different angles. The whole like pack of terrorists are behind him, and he's. It's just a great introduction. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if you noticed this, but so he's always at the center. I know, like as they come out of the truck, he's at the center. As they come out of the elevator, he's at the center. He's the only one not carrying a gun. Every, all the other, other, so like they they're doing all these subtle things to tell you this is the leader, right? Like this is the mastermind. Yeah, and, and he's also and so capable. He doesn't need a gun. He does very calm. Like, yeah, he, everybody else is moving quickly. He's moving very slowly, confidently. Yeah, I, I, it's great. I, I, you immediately know that group, like that Alan Rickman, is the head honcho, and they don't even have to say that, right? Right. And just to throw this in here, I'm, I've got a ton of facts that we can talk about later. But this is Alan Rickman's first film, his first feature film. Wow. Yeah, so it's like he I mean he was like 41 and I think he and, had a lot of experience. And that's why I mean I know stage. you're a big Harry Potter fan, but he will always be Hans Gruber to me playing yeah. a wizard in the Harry Potter movies, not I think, Snape uh, you know playing an you know a, a terrorist like a lot of people think. I think I saw him in Harry Potter first, so I I he's Snape to me, but I mean Gruber's a great role. I love that role. <laughs> Probably one of the I mean he's a very notable villain. Like when you think about movie villains, like he's up there on the list. Um, I, in this opening area, just a couple things I wanted to talk about. One of them was Bruce, uh, sorry, John McClain is carrying a giant bear at the beginning of this film, which he then leaves in the, leaves in the limo. And then, um, Argyle agrees to just wait for an unspecified amount of time on Christmas Eve for him to maybe, in case he maybe needs a ride. Yeah, so. I don't know how, like, this almost seems completely unbelievable, but, like, for some reason, Argyle is so nice that I buy it. He's also, but, like, man. it's, like, his first ride ever, he said. Like, he'd never driven anybody in a limo before. And also, yeah. he's like, yeah, I'll wait. He's like, just make sure once once I'm done waiting or whatever, you, you remember that for the tip. So I was like, I mean, I would sit there for a, a big tip, I guess. How freaking big would that tip have to be, though? Because he's, I mean, like, even before he starts to be like, what's going on? He's been sitting there for, like, over an hour. He's partying with a bear, though. He gets to party and listen to rap music and, and like, uh, what else was he doing? He was calling yeah. people on the phone, on the car phone. And so, and okay, so it's, I know it's a small point, but John John McClane brought the bear all the way on the plane with him, carried it all the way through the airport, and then is just going to leave it in the car and probably not even go back to the car because if, he, if he's going to go back with Holly, his plan is to not go back to the car. So he's just left the bear now. Yeah, I don't know. There's no explaining that one away. Maybe, uh, it's, maybe it's just weird. Know. It's just a weird thing. It's they, they didn't want him to be carrying it around. I think in the building. Yeah, they liked the image of him carrying it in the airport, and then they're like, "All right, he just needs to drop it." They wanted people to know that it was in the limo at the end of the movie. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so he does end up getting it, I guess. Um, also, uh, so okay, so another thing that has changed for me is well, changed and in some ways did the same. Ellis is awful. He is like yeah. a super reprehensible character. Every time he says anything, he's terrible. But the scene of him sexually harassing Holly is how we first meet him. 
He's following her down the hallway. She clearly is not interested in his advances. He's coming on to her. He's talking about having, you know, a romantic thing around the fire that she doesn't want any part of. And in the light of all the sexual harassment stuff going on right now, that scene was just kind of like super icky to me because it shows how much women have just been dealing with this shit because it's so ho-hum for her. She's like, yeah, this is just what I deal with, right? I mean, and a male filmmaker thought it was... He's like, let's put this in my movie because it's not. He, he didn't even think anything of it, probably. You know what I mean? He's like, this is how. Well, it I mean, is like, in the and yes, and like, like it makes it us was. dislike Ellis, but in a way, it's also, it's it's also just like this is the stuff she deals with, and she's fine with it. We're all like, it, there's a certain acceptance there. Like, yeah, of course, this is what she deals with, and this is what like you know this whole movement is trying to change. But it looks back at like you think things are bad now, you know, twenty, thirty years ago. They were really bad and no one was doing anything about them. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So Ellis, I abs- I mean, he's made to be hated. And oh my God, does it feel so good to hate him? He's so t- he's such a piece of garbage. Like, And it's funny because he's so bad that I feel like he became the stereotype of the, like, I don't know if you've seen, there's an episode of Futurama where there's a guy who's like the 80s businessman. And he's like, I forget he's brought back or something. And he talks just like Ellis. He's so up his own ass and... You know, it just it's like braggadociousness, and it's he's so bad. Yeah, it's really bad. But I love to hate him too, though. Like it is fun to root, it, like to just hate him and to see him. Like it's it, that's a weird moment. We are I'm like cheering for the terrorists for shooting him. <laughs> like thank God. I, that's something that I really never felt before. But in this this time that I watched it, I was a little bit cheering for the terrorists sometimes. Not against John McClane, but in other ways. Like it was, it, I don't know. I never really. I feel like they just pulled me in this time, like like Alan Rickman, or I don't know. Yeah. Well, and I mean, like, you do feel bad for Ellis a little bit, maybe, because he's so dumb. Like, clearly, he is an idiot. And so, like, you don't necessarily want to see an idiot get shot for being an idiot. But it's also kind of, like, just desserts for that character, because he's so terrible. Yeah. I don't know. At this point, the terrorists uh, take hostages. This is this is after Gruber has been introduced and the terrorists are there. They take hostages and they start firing guns. And so John realizes this. Something's going on. He runs out uh, with his gun and no shoes on out of Holly's office, which is setting us up for a lot of hijinks in the in the future. Oh, uh, yes. I love that detail. Both the novel and the book. I've said that that's, one, that's probably my favorite detail is him not having shoes. Before we move on from it, I did want to say we talked about it's, it's only fair because we, we gave Roderick Thorpe some crap for his main character being super attractive and like flirting with every woman he comes in contact with. The same thing is true for the, for, for John McClane in this movie. Not only is he like flirtatious, but like he is actively ogling every woman that comes on screen. We get a yeah, scene of him like checking them out like every single time. In the beginning, um, it's it's like, because I mean, there's not many more women throughout for, after the beginning. No, there's but when actually, he's in the airport, a couple. When he's in there's, the airport and, yeah. and then the girl who jumps into that guy's arms. Yes, uh, and then the there's the girl who's in a, um, she's in like an apartment that he sees at one point. Oh, he's yeah. He's like freaking out. Well, I thought and that he was kind of seeing the, her. Um, I thought he was seeing her and like realizing like that, that his idea would be, he was like, how do I get help? And then he like sees her out there on the phone. So I thought he was like, oh, I couldn't get, like contact somebody outside to get them to call the police or something. But maybe, but it's also a little bit of the, um, like you, you, she's, you know, scantily clad. So it's very much a like, um, voyeuristic moment too for him yeah that's true um not that he like is all creepy about it but it just is and then like i don't know the thing with the the nude um poster and how he keeps coming back to it and like it, it, there's just like that's just we get an impression that he just is like that like he just appreciates women right right and it's it's obviously like a sleazeball thing but like that's like the the typical action hero in the 80s is right. like gonna be like every woman wants him and he wants every woman and yes John, so John's running around. He's trying to form a plan, and Hans, uh, he sees Hans with Mr. Takagi, and he won't give him the codes to get into the safe that they want to get into. So Hans brutally kills and murders Takagi. Um, and John sees this and he like runs away. And he gets away, but like realizes he needs a plan. So he pulls the fire alarm, which alerts the police for the first time. And the terrorists also to his location so they they know what location the fire alarm has been pulled in so they go after him uh one it's one terrorist this time and he has to fight them and eventually he kills him by falling down the stairs and breaking his neck we learn later that this is carl's brother and he takes his gun and his radio 
and he puts the guy into an elevator in a chair and he writes now i have a machine gun ho 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 on a shirt sends it down (laughs) there's so many good character moments here and i just want to take a moment to talk about some of them but um for gruber when he's talking to takagi and, and they're talking about the model he says i always loved to make models as a child the exactness the attention to detail and he talks about being classically, ed- like having a classical education. There's these things that are like telling us he is a very intelligent, very meticulous, like it, that him talking about the model is by extension talking about his plan here, right? Like every detail has been picked out by him. So that's just like a cool, it's like he's he's menacing Takagi on the surface, but like underneath he's actually characterizing himself for the audience so that we know who he is. I also wanted to talk to you about why I wanted to you just give me your take as why do we like John McClane? Like why does why do audiences like that character? It's kind of a I have an answer for this, so I just want you to say what you. I feel like it's it's um it's kind of that Western thing. It's kind of that cowboy on his own against a group of people that we see as bad, um, you know, saving the day single handedly and and doing something that's almost superhuman. Nobody could actually do this. You know what I mean? If they did this it would be the biggest feat of all time. And like nobody's able to take out an entire building versus terrorists and save everybody and, uh, you know, jump off the building and make it into a window. It's I, I think it's just like a little bit of like seeing him as like this hero. And it's funny because like in the 80s, you would see him as a different kind of hero than today because of the, you know, those holdovers from society. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right on. Um, what I wanted to add to that is that I think that's all the, that's the reason we like action movies. And that's the reason we like action heroes. But the reason that we love John McClane, I think is that all of that is juxtaposed to his vulnerability. And because he is actually very vulnerable in a lot of ways. Like we see him get in a fight with Holly and then he's like being a huge asshole and he's obviously got anger issues, right? And he, she walks out and immediately like banks his head on the door and admonishes himself, says, great job, John, you know, really did it, you know, really did it there. Yeah. And we, so we see like these moments of vulnerability in him that I really like. And, you know, him not having his shoes is like a, a symbolic vulnerability for him, right? Like he's this high flying action hero who's taking everybody out, but he's very vulnerable and glass still cuts him. He's still human, you know? And he still he still feels pain, you know, like very <laughs> like we're going to get to that scene. But there's a there's a scene where he's pulling glass out of his foot. And I still cringe when I see that scene. Like I felt myself do it. And then I kind of caught myself. And I was like, I just cringed at a scene I've seen 20 times. But as he's pulling like and he's, and like, he's like it, the camera pans down to his bloody messed up foot. And he's like trying to get glass out of it. I, cr- I just like. Ugh. And like that's the kind of thing that I think makes this character so good, and and also that's wound up in another scene of vulnerability for him when he's talking about wanting Al to give a message to his wife, and he starts tearing up. And so I, I think that's what sets this character apart from a lot of other action movies, a lot of other action heroes. Definitely. When you were when you were going through and saying the scenes, the the one that really sticks out to me is the the glass and and talking to Al and telling him to to reach his wife and all of that and. It is, and and I think a lot of movies realize that like the vulnerabilities of John McClane is like what makes action movies, what makes this specific action movie so good, and then they try to emulate that, and it's it's still like not to the quite the effect that you get here. And we kind of see that like his bravado and his masculinity and his over the top, like that's all kind of an act. Like yes, it's true, but like underneath, he's not really that guy. And so it, it makes us see that it's like a defense mechanism for him and that he's using it to do the things he's doing, but he's not really that to his core. Like he's actually a more vulnerable guy, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I feel like this is a pretty good place to stop and talk to you guys about Audible. We have an Audible affiliate link. It's audibletrial.com forward slash ink to film. And with that free trial, you get 30 free days and one free credit for any audiobook in their collection. Yeah, and uh, this week I thought I'd suggest the book Altered Carbon by Richard K. Morgan. And the reason being that uh, Netflix has released a trailer for a new series that's coming out in early February, I believe, uh, for the uh, for this book. And so we're going to cover it. And if you want to go ahead and get a jump start on this book, it is called Alt- Altered Carbon. It is a cyberpunk 
kind of Blade Runner esque type world. If you check out that that uh, trailer, I think you can absolutely see ties to to those movies. Um, and yeah, that's going to be a project coming up here pretty soon for us. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I watched the trailer. It's coming to Netflix. Everybody's got Netflix, so be ready to jump onto that project. It'll be our first TV show that we're going to try covering, so it'll be interesting to see how it goes. It's kind of an experiment for us. We'd love to have you stick around for it. <laughs> That's uh, audibletrial.com forward slash ink to film, and you can get that for free. It's a free credit and uh, free 30 days. So John McClane takes the radio that he got off of the first terrorist body, and he goes to the roof to get a good signal on it. And he's radioing for help and Gruber realizes that where would you go for the best place with signal the roof. So Gruber sends the terrorists up to the roof and they start shooting at him. He escapes. He kind of gets away, shoots back at him, escapes. Get it, he gets away by climbing into AC ducts. And um, when he climbs out of those AC ducts, he sees a cop coming to investigate the call for help over the radio and, and from the fire alarm. And he tries to signal the cop uh, but he's making a lot of noise trying to break the window. So two terrorists come down and he has to fight them. And at this point, he get, like, gets under a table and one's like shooting down at him and he's having to like shoot up. And you actually told me a story that you saw or heard um, about mm -hmm. this part that I figure you should tell now. Yeah, uh, from what I understand here, uh, Bruce Willis actually suffered permanent hearing loss, uh, like a certain percentage of his hearing, because they would f on the set they were firing real guns with, filled with blanks, not just putting in, you know, the gunfire after the fact like they often do in movies these days. And because of that, they're extremely loud. And so the scene where Bruce Willis is laying on his back under the table and he fires the gun straight up next to his head, he uh, he suffered some permanent hearing loss from, from firing that gun. And I, the, the, the overall, that leads me to something I want to say. I, I think the guns sound amazing in this movie. Like they're, they have like a real bassy punch to them. And they just sound better than a lot of other movies I've seen. Yeah. I will say that the silence bullets I felt like sounded weird, but the normal bullets mm. definitely sounded good. Um, yeah. And I think that's, I think good that's some, it's good that Bruce Willis uh, really like embraced the role and suffered for his art. He was like, under the, I don't think he realized he was going to get permanent no, hearing loss. I don't loss, think he planned for that. <laughs> it's, still, it's still, I mean, he's like, how badass is that? That he's like, yeah, you like Die Hard? Well, I lost part of myself in that movie. <laughs> yeah um th there's so we just covered a lot of ground there's a couple of things i definitely want to talk about in that sections in those sections there <laughs> so when he talks on the on the on the radio he gets a dispatch lady oh my god and she's this... super di she's super dismissive of everything he's saying which like that's another moment where i'm like this does not play today today mm -hmm. like everyone's so paranoid about terrorists and so paranoid about shootings there's no way in hell someone calls in something like this and it just gets blown off. But it plays because like that it was a different time. People took things less seriously. But no fucking shit, lady. Do I sound like I'm ordering a pizza? <laughs> so such a good. Well, line. It's also his delivery is great. He's like, yeah. Uh, she's yeah. like, this, he, this like his voice goes up at the end. And... He's like, he's like, no shit, lady. Does it sound like I'm ordering a pizza? <laughs> yeah. So good, and she's so like unreasonably calm and just like now you know I don't know. It's it's it's. It's crazy. Um, so, oh, so something else. On the He's running around on the roof, and he's hip-firing that machine gun the entire time. I don't know if you noticed this. Every time he sees terrorists, he's just hip-firing at them. And, of course, he doesn't hit any of them. <laughs> and I remember thinking, like, this is such bad form. Like, I don't know why we were okay with this in the past with our, like, action heroes. But, like, give me John Wick. You know what I mean? Give me someone who's looking down the sights and, you know, firing with a purpose. And that's actually what he got more in the in the novel, right? Like he was very he would do these controlled bursts and he was very accurate with them. But no. John McClane is just wildly firing from the hip and missing everything. There's something about spraying and praying. I get, I think it's all the flashy bullets. All the flashy bullets yeah. and noises and Oh, well, which and it gets keeps something... the gun out of his face so we can see his face reacting as he's shooting and looking all badass. That's true, yeah. Um, something I, I meant to mention before when you were talking about uh, special effects and that kind of thing is the the squibs and the blood spurts and everything in this movie look great. Like I was like, holy, yeah. holy hell. Like they don't look like squid. Like usually there's like such a burst of blood when you see a squib. And these were like kind of like they were like re reeled in a little bit. They weren't like quite as like gooey and like just the shots to the legs. Remember when he shoots the guy in the legs? 
the guy's oh like, yeah you're talking about that later yeah he leg. shoots the guy in the leg he like tears his knees up and then the guy falls and his head goes through a pane of glass yes you're talking that about that was, scene yes that is so that's a, such a cool scene yeah that scene is so well like just think about the special effects and the stunt stunt coordination that that went into that yeah um, so when he goes down in that air duct and he delivers that famous, you know, a couple of famous lines, actually, because he, he delivers the uh, uh, come out to the coast, have a few laughs like that line. And then like immediately he says, you know, now I know what a TV dinner feels like. Like I, he's just like a one line machine. And like I, for whatever reason, like I buy it from him. Like he is just this guy who would be saying this kind of stuff to himself. Like it's almost like hyping himself up like he's keeping it light for himself. Yeah. And I, I don't know. I think it's super endearing. It's funny that you can see the correlation between like action films like they there there was like the the cheesy one liner led into like the more like comic relief one liner and now we see in our action movies like I mean the very successful blockbusters are like your superhero movies and a lot of those superhero movies right now are just filled with like tension breaking comedic lines. I mean I like it. I enjoy it and I have a lot of fun with those movies. But it's like you can almost see the roots are like a John McClane character. That's like yeah. more actiony. It's, it's interesting because I, I know exactly what you're talking about, and and it is kind of tension breaking in a lot of these modern movies. I don't know that it. I think it here it doesn't do that as much. I don't know. Like, yeah, I, that's what I'm saying. Like, I think the progression yeah. comes down, and I think that he yeah, does a good job. Yeah, I think there's a way to do movie. it right, and I think this movie does it right. Yeah, he and he's he, it's still like I laugh, like I laugh hard yeah. sometimes at, at like his lines. And it, it's still like, yeah, that tension is maybe it's the location, the one. Location I guess it filmed. is still lessened because if you're laughing, you're not frightened. If you're laughing, right. you're not tense. So you're right. Like it by definition lessens the tension. That's true. But yeah, I, I thought that was really cool that he's this is like I mean, there's ever since there's been action movies, there's been like one liners, I feel like. But th- this he's like these these are like the peak of it i feel yeah, like yeah this is some of the best this is some of the best version of that i agree this is like kind of like guardians of the galaxy a little bit i guess like right like it's that kind of like like people love these lines like you still feel the stakes i'm not i don't want to say that like there's no stakes or anything in the marvel movies yeah. and stuff that's not true at all but they're 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 like i welcome those those funny moments like I, I look forward to those as well as the action beats and i think it does a lot i mean and that whole scene is kind of unbelievable too where he is crawling in the in the in the air duct and then like Carl comes along with his gun to push up on each one, right? Yeah. If you put a human being in a duct designed for air, for air conditioning, you're going to be able to see where the human being is at. <laughs> There's no way in hell that you can like you're light enough to not like make it bow or something if it doesn't just fall out of the roof already. But even assuming that it doesn't, you can look at that and tell there's a person in that one right there cuz it's bowing down like crazy. <laughs> yeah. But whatever. I mean, ultimately this is a movie where some really unbelievable stuff happens at the end. So, well, I'll buy this thing. <laughs> so the cop is leaving. Uh, that was kind of coming to investigate because he feels like everything's good to go. He comes in and nothing's really going on in his opinion. So he goes to leave and John sees this and he like throws a body off the off the the, uh, the building that he's at and it lands on the cop car and all the terrorists are opening fire and shooting at him and and he's like freaking out the cops trying to get out of there and this is when john's just like you know what he's like i gotta i gotta take control of the situation so he takes uh some c4 puts a puts a monitor on top of it straps it down to a chair and pushes it down an elevator shaft and blows the whole elevator shaft and like everybody freaks out and stops fighting and the cop calls back up and uh, this is when Gruber and John start talking to each other over the over the radio directly, whereas before they would overhear each other. But that that explosion is just like highly irresponsible, but pretty badass. <laughs> like, what if the whole building came down when he did that? Yeah, I mean, so uh, so we're kind of I think these are kind of two different scenes, really. Uh, the the first scene is where Al gets he throws the body down on Al and he gets shot at. Um, that scene is so cool to me because it shows. <laughs> John is so frustrated at this point and they do such a good job of showing Al just being like super lackadaisical and like just being almost obtuse about what's going on and not willing to look into anything. And he's just been dicked around by this, (laughs) you know, this woman on the radio. So I totally buy that that John is just super frustrated so much so that he's willing to throw a body onto this cop car. And then when he starts getting shot at the welcome to the party pal line is so it, it, it's so good because it does kind of alert us to the fact that this character isn't going to die 
like it's okay for us to kind of cheer for this moment and be okay like it's like an audience thing right where we can we can laugh because he wouldn't say that if he said that that character's not just going to get killed right like we know that so it's it's an interesting kind of meta thing that goes on there too i think and then um after the fact when he calls in all the reinforcements they decide to go in right away with officer Dwayne T Robinson calling the shots uh, character from the book and that's when uh, when he drops the bomb because the terrorists are uh, are shooting are shooting the SWAT team members and they, I think they're shooting the big car with a RPG and he says uh, he says Let, you know stop it Hans they got the point and then Hans says yeah I'll take it under advisement and then he he puts the thing on there and he goes uh, he goes like take this under advisement jerkweed which is literally what he says um, which is like a weird line like, I don't know there's so many of like, these lines that I I almost don't hear sometimes and that's one of them too. And uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know that that one's as iconic, right? <laughs> Jerkweed. <laughs> yeah, but it could have. He was taking a risk, you know. That what could have been the one line that stuck out to everybody, and everybody was saying, <laughs> yeah. "Jerkweed, what are you doing, Jerkweed?" So yeah, the this is when he pushes the C four because uh, they're they're like rocket shooting rockets at like armored cars and stuff that the cops are coming up with, and like that's a said. cool scene, by the way. Like I don't know how they did that, but man, that looked good. That looked just like a real rocket getting shot at something from. I don't know. It looks really good. Yeah. So after this, this call, like everything kind of calms down because John like blew up half the building uh, or should have. It should have. I don't really know what the explosion did. It doesn't seem like it did any structural damage. But No, it ki- well, it does. It kills, um, I think, couple, two yeah. of the terrorists in this one. Yeah. Um, oh, so I did want to say here um, a couple of things. One, Dwayne Robinson is, is fucking terrible. He's terrible. And he's almost as bad as Ellis, to be quite honest. Um, yeah. When Al is questioning him. And going like, how are you going to go in there? There's terrorists. And he's like, where are the terrorists? We haven't heard from them. You know, he's being so cavalier. And then Al says, what about the body? He says, well, who knows? Probably some stockbroker who got depressed. (sighs) And it's so like, oh, my God. The face that Al makes is really good because it's the only face you can make. Because this guy's being such an idiot on purpose. Willfully idiotic. And, you know, everything that happens, you could lay at his feet. (laughs) Um, Speaking of, (laughs) uh, the SWAT team takes i don't know 30 seconds to try and get through a pair of glass doors what is, what's up with that they're trying to pick it instead of yeah it was i thought that was dumb the, 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 the terrorists shoot them through the glass blowing the glass apart so it's not bulletproof like literally they just have to walk up and do one controlled burst and they go right walk right through that door but instead yeah. they spend like 30 seconds trying to saw it it's so stupid like i uh, the police overall are just really bad in this movie. Um, they're almost comic relief. They're so bad. They're so inept at everything they're doing. Definitely. Oh, so yeah, there's a, a moment when they're coming in where where, where John uh, John says, "You're coming in, aren't you?" And like, I feel like that's super irresponsible on John's part because it then cuts to Hans, who's like, "All right, they're coming in," and they all get ready. <laughs> and I'm like, "Did John just like totally call out the SWAT team's position and let Hans get the jump on him?" I don't know. I, I think it's. The, the police are so inept that, like, we feel like it just wasn't going to go well anyway. But there's a little bit of, like, I, I don't know, John kind of, like, uh, sells out sells them out there a little bit. Yeah, I thought about that, too, when that was happening. He, they keep saying things over the radio, and I'm like, ooh, should you have said that? That's kind of, oh, no, what's going to happen now? Yeah. Oh, he uh, he does also make a, uh, Hans makes a Rambo reference. He's, like, talking about, uh, you're, you're seeing too many action movies, right? And this is also a cool kind of meta moment, right? Because he's talking, this is an action movie and he's talking about action movies. Um, but yeah, he says like, oh, you must be like, you, you've seen Rambo. You think you're J- Rambo and John Wayne and all this stuff. And I was like, when did Rambo come out? Like, this has to be around the same time, right? And probably a few years later, but. Yeah, I mean, I I think Rambo was like a, a bit before. Uh, Rambo was like, I don't know, early 80s, I think. Like 80 something, 82, 83. 82 okay so six years but yeah that's definitely a quick turnaround for a reference from a from a terrorist yeah and did you notice he also says um they have enough they have enough c4 in here to put schwarzenegger in orbit or something like that or yeah. orbit schwarzenegger there's a bunch so, of little movie things yeah like he's referencing another actor there that's like a famous action star so it's interesting because it, it kind of grounds this movie in a way and is like this is our world and he's seen these same movies and i don't know there's something kind of yeah. meta about this movie definitely i the the whole cowboy um 
thing that comes up there where that's when he starts calling him cowboy and he's like uh what do you think you're john wayne rambo uh i don't remember but he says i'm more i'm more partial oh, roy Ro- he's like yeah yeah marshall dylan and then he's like I- i'm more part i was always partial to roy rogers and uh I re- he was like i really like the sequence shirts which is hilarious and then, yeah, obviously this is when he says, do you really think you stand a chance against this cowboy? And this is McLean's like, yippee motherfucker. Yeah, you're right. That so classic. I love that scene. Um, the whole Western thing like kind of comes to a head later um, because Gruber mocks McLean at like near the end. And he says like, this, this isn't going to end like an American Western with Grace Kelly riding off into the sunset with John, with John Wayne. And he's like, yeah. M- McLean like corrects him and is like, um, he, he's like, you mean Gary Cooper? And so I went to look at the Gary Cooper film and uh, it's High Noon. And what's funny is that High Noon is actually an action movie that has a lone hero having to defeat a large group of enemies while being vastly outnumbered as well. So it's like within oh, itself, it's referencing like kind of a, another standoff against like one versus many fil- like action film. So around this time, after the, st- the fighting stopped and everything's calmed down, we see Ellis and he's trying to like con his con Gruber and like tell him that he knows John and he's going to try to get John to, to show himself. But ultimately, John like says like, no, this guy doesn't know me. And Gruber shoots him because of that. And the police freak out because they think like, oh, my God, he let him kill. Not not Al, but the other police all freak out because they're like, I can't believe he let that guy die. He should turn himself in. And um, it, it's just like this moment where the cops are like completely against him and the f i think around this time the fbi shows up and they start to take point and gruber uh, like a, like a scene later gruber goes to check on the explosives that they have up at the roof and this is a really interesting turn for the movie because um i feel like the filmmaker wanted john mcclain and gruber to meet before their final showdown and this is like yeah. the, his way of doing it he had gruber who's the leader who wouldn't go up to check the explosives on his own i feel but anyway he went yeah. up to cho- he went up to check the explosives and this is when John McClane finds him, holds him a gunpoint, and and we get to hear Alan, uh, Alan Rickman's like amazing American accent, <laughs> and he acts like he's an employee who they, they got lost up there. And and John eventually they smoke a cigarette together, and and he like he like asks him his name, and he has a name ready to go, and he looks at like the plaque on the wall. McClane looks at the plaque on the wall and sees like that's an actual name from somebody who works there. So he he believes him seemingly, and hands him a gun and starts to walk away uh, hans pulls up the gun uh calls back up over the radio and pulls the trigger on him and he's like no bullets and like grabs the gun back from him which is just yeah, it's a such great a cool scene. like it's a it's this like cat and mouse battle of like cleverness right because we see hans being extremely clever not only does he say clay he says bill clay and then we see that it's wm so right. we know that he's he is he has figured out that that's William and that this guy could go by Bill. Like, you know what I mean? Like he's so smart in the way that he does it, which makes it seem so believable. So we're like, Oh shit, he's going to believe this. But then John McClane is, you know, just as clever, if not more clever. And he knows that this is bullshit. And he at least was willing to test it by giving him, by giving him a gun that didn't have any bullets in it. Um, so yeah, that's, it's uh, that's all really good stuff. I love that stuff. Oh, I did want to, I did want to ask you. Okay. So, this is something that has always bothered me about this movie. They use radios in this movie in ways that radios do not work. And it has always bothered me. <laughs> like, do you notice this? Like, I don't know if I'm, if, if I'm, maybe I'm drawing attention to it in a way. Cause when I was a kid, I had these little walkie talkies and we used to actually talk on these things. And so I know that when you push the button down, you broadcast and the other person can't talk until you are done broadcasting and you release that button. That is not how the radios work in this movie. They are constantly cutting each other off. Dwayne Robinson starts to say something, and then John McClane comes over top of him and says, what are you talking about? And like, he, like, he interrupts him. And every time it happens, I go, that's not how radios work. <laughs> I mean, it's traumatic, and it works for like that, but like, I, I don't know. They, they have no regard for how radios actually work in this movie. <laughs> It'd be funny if they were, had like the noises every time they click the button, so they're like, bloop, 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 bloop. Yeah. Well, and actually, I this isn't a problem in just this movie. I don't know if you've noticed it, but like any movie in any show that has radios, they always do this. Yeah. Because it's dramatically interesting to have people be able to cut each other off. But that's not how radios work. Right. Sorry. <laughs> oh, and Geronimo, motherfucker. Uh, he does say that when he throws the bomb. So 
you're right. It is in both uh, the book and the movie. I wanted to give you credit for that. You called it. Nice. Thanks, dude. <laughs> so, the, uh, <laughs> I, I forgot where it was. I thought that it was going to be, uh, thought that it was earlier for some reason. But yeah, when it finally showed up, I was like, oh, oh there it is. <laughs> so yeah, when uh, Hans calls for backup over the radio, a bunch of terrorists show up and, and they have a firefight. And John gets like stuck in this area with a ton of glass and Hans is like, shoot that glass. And they start taking out all the glass around Mm -hmm. him. And he's like, he can't figure, he's like, at first he's like, why the hell are they shooting all the glass and not shooting me? And then he goes to try to get to the exit and looks at the glass and we know that he's like, oh shit. And there's like a flashbang that goes off that they throw. It's more of the head games with Gruber here, right? Because it's another moment of Gruber being, showing how smart he is. Yeah. I think Carl throws a flashbang and goes off. And in that moment, he runs out to the exit leaving behind a trail of blood that he, because he, he stepped with his bare feet on the glass. And like you said, this is like, this is probably the thing I think of when I think of Die Hard. Like this and jumping off the roof are the things yeah. that I think of. Yeah, the sending the guy down in the elevator is probably the other one for me with the message yeah. on his, written on his chest. Like, yeah, those maybe those three. Absolutely. He has to like get to a bathroom and he's like pulling glass out of his feet. And this, you were just talking about the walkie talkies. How is he able to like click the walkie talkie on and talk to them while he's pulling glass out of his feet is what I want to know. I mean, like, I don't, there might be a, there might be a way to like leave it on. But the thing is you wouldn't be able to talk. You'd only be able to talk one way. That's the thing. Radios are one way. So if you push that button, you start talking, you can't get, receive anything until you release the button. So yeah, it's weird. We shouldn't harp on it too much because like ultimately whatever. But uh, yeah, I mean, we talked about this great scene when it shows his vulnerability. Um, I I, I do want to give a little bit of credit for them because I think this movie is a little bit better about race than it is about uh, about women. (laughs) Well, towards Um, Al, I agree with you, but there's still a little bit of race. Well, and if you still think about it, like Argyle is like there's still a little bit something weird there, but he's shown as being like he's one of the genuinely good characters in the movie. Yeah. Um, we we like at first John McClane's skeptical of him, but like we immediately like him, and he ends up being like one of the one of the our favorite characters in the movie. He's like a fan favorite, and then the terrorist, um, who who is a person of color, um, is he's like the smart one. So I I, I thought it was a nice kind of subversion of like what you would expect. Like he's like the nerdy really smart computer guy so i don't know like it, i'm not saying it's a great movie but like in that regard but it seems like there was like a deliberate attempt to subvert some stereotypes yeah i actually forgot to mention that that guy's cracked me up a couple of times the they're i like, wanted to ask you if he was funny. over the top or not because uh, there are some some t- some of his lines are like i don't know like he's at one point he's like oh the quarterback is toast and like i don't know like it, there's a couple of times where he's, oh, he's at almost the beginning, too much yeah but, yeah i mean i agree but, but I, I do I like him know. and he does a little rhyme about all through the house there was two assholes coming in a two by two formation or whatever and like mm-hmm. he's got some good lines in there but um yeah i think i think he stayed just to the side of being funny and not quite just being terrible yeah. <laughs> um so, also I, I don't know if you noticed we haven't got to the end but he doesn't die him yeah. and I think one other terrorist, two of the well, terrorists actually might, survive. Yeah, I guess he doesn't die he's technically, but he's like... He doesn't die. He's taken out. Which is different than the, the book, because in the book, Joe Leland murders every single terrorist. Yeah. <laughs> Brutally. So, McLean, uh, like you said, he's he's cleaning out his feet, like we talked about. And I, I was just going to mention that I bought... I really did buy Al and, and um, John McLean's... Um, relationship in this film more than i remembered like i was like oh yeah like i for some reason i have remembered it being kind of just like forced but it's not it's like i really bought it and in this moment we get al talking about how he why he was um like he won't shoot at people anymore because he accidentally killed a 13 year old kid and another thing that does not hold up very well today because oh definitely that's a real problem and uh, i don't know that we're as forgiving because we've seen that um it's not so much an accident as it can be uh a willful uh, lack of self-control on the part of the police quite often. Yep. Anyway, I, I don't know that it makes him quite as like, you know, cause like his whole arc is about his ability to like draw his gun again at the end and we're supposed to cheer it. But I don't know how much we should really be cheering this guy who's killed a child. <laughs> and by the way, yep. his delivery of that line, I shot a kid. <laughs> like, I don't know. So good. <laughs> like, oh, I don't know. I, I, I will never forget how he delivers that line. I, I don't know what it is about it. Because he says something like, oh, what happened? You run over your, you know, your, your commanding officer's foot. And he goes, 
I shot a kid. <laughs> I don't know. It's something good about it. So uh, after this, John makes his way up to the roof and he gets in this crazy battle with Carl where they're like slamming each other into walls and scaffolding and all this stuff. And it's pretty, pretty cool fight. Really well thought out because they're like fighting their way up towards the, the I guess they're are they coming down from the roof or up? They're going one way or the yeah. other, and there's choppers on the way. We know that there are choppers. Okay, in the so air. We, we didn't talk about we didn't talk about the FBI guys who show up. Their names are Johnson and Johnson. Okay, and this comes back to like a theme I want to talk about at the end because <laughs> um, I think it's more of a general overall thing about this movie, and I want to get your take on it. But <laughs> do you think they're making a dick joke here? They might be because they keep talking about. Well, they they're either making a dick joke or it's just like. They were just like, what's the most like common name that somebody would have that we can give these guys? Because there was a joke in there where they were like, somebody calls over the radio and he's like, yes, yeah, Johnson. And he's like, no, the other one. So we're supposed to think like every time they talk so, on the radio, they're like, no, I don't know if you, caught, if you caught this, but in the, sub, at the at the very end credits, they're listed as Big Johnson and Little Johnson. <laughs> no, I didn't see that. <laughs> yeah, which kind of makes me think maybe they were making a dick joke too. They were then, yeah, they were. <laughs> Even if it was just a payoff in the in the credits. That's pretty funny. But I have more I want to say about the the FBI and how they play into this movie because I think it ties into some other things, but uh, let's save that for the end because it's general stuff. The scene where Carl and him are fighting is so good. Like that fight is so just like Bruce Willis just goes crazy and he just starts like wailing on him. But then the way like he takes those hits and then is able to just like calmly like throw him around afterwards. And it's clear that he's like, he can just weather the storm. I don't know. It's such a cool, interesting dynamic because they both fight so differently, but so effectively. And in the end, uh, the fight makes its way to like a, a staircase and there's like a chain. Which leads up to the roof. Which leads up to the roof. There's like a chain. I want to point, I want to point out because I'm going to make, <laughs> I, I want to talk a lot about Carl, <laughs> but okay, yes. There's a chain that, that Bruce Willis is, or uh, that McLean is able to grab and wrap around his neck. And he effectively hangs him and like pushes him away. And he's like hung on the chains. The The staircase leads up to the roof. So McLean goes up to the roof he, and all of the um, hostages are up there. And he, he gets his gun and he like gets up close to them and he's like, go turn around, turn around. This whole place is rigged to blow. And he starts shooting his gun up into the air. And so the people in the chopper, the FBI agents see the shooting and they think, oh, OK, this guy's a terrorist. He's freaking out. And he cool like scene where um, we down. see we see him from the like view of the helicopter shooting yeah. the gun in the air. I thought that was a really awesome. cool scene. Yeah, it's cool. So he's shooting it up in the air. They all, most of them, run down. Actually, I'm assuming all of them run down. And yeah. he, uh, this is where he like the, goes. The helicopter's over. trying to take him out, right? The helicopter's trying to shoot him, and so he's yeah. like trying to get it to an angle where they won't have a shot on him. And he gets down to this the area where he grabs a fire hose, wraps it around his waist and is like talking to himself about how he's like never going to go back on top of another skyscraper again and then he jumps off and swings shoots at the glass and and falls into the window of a floor well, further and the down. roof explodes as he's jumping off yeah probably should mention that taking out taking out the the helicopters too i think both of them so the helicopters were trying to like land and, and potentially get guys on the ground to start fighting against the terrorists, but they were blown to smithereens as he jumped off. And this is the scene we talked about in another episode, but when he first gets in and the, the, the fire hose is dragging him down, it's like, it's so, it's so good. There's the way it's yeah, shot. Yeah, where the he way almost gets pulled out the window. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's rewind a little bit. He scares the, the hostages. They go running off the, 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 the building. We cut to a scene where they're coming down the stairs from the roof and they're passing by the lifeless corpse of Carl still hanging from the chain minutes after he's been originally put there, right? Right. And like his, at first his hand was up around the chain. Now it's not. Now both hands are just like dangling by his sides. <laughs> Super dead. Also, he is in the stairwell leading to the roof that gets detonated by the fucking bomb seconds later. How is he alive at the end of this movie? I want you to he's, explain it to me. <laughs> he's um, I don't know, man. He did it though. He somehow made it. It's 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 movie magic. It, there is there is literally no way this character is still alive at the end of this movie. It's yeah. impossible. 
I actually never really is. realized that shot was there before that you're talking about when I until I saw it this time and I saw like his body hanging and I was like, oh, that's an interesting touch. And I didn't even put two and two together that like he shows up again at the end of the movie because I just knew it was going to happen. And I totally forgot that yeah. like he was supposed he's to be He's still dead. alive at the end of the movie. And he's in a part of the building that gets blown up. That is right at the roof. Yeah. He's dead. That's a dead guy. <laughs> he's a ghost. He's a ghost at the end. A zombie, maybe, perhaps. Yeah. He's the first zombie of The Walking Dead. <laughs> so, <laughs> the uh, the news, there's been news around and stuff, and I didn't really think it was that important to mention, but I just, we need to mention it for the fact that the news uh, reporters go and find McLean's house. They go in, and his kids are being watched by a um, nanny or something. So, she's she's kind of watching over their kids while they're gone, and the newscaster guy comes up to her, and he's like, he's like, if you don't let me in right now, I'm going to call the IRS. Did he say INS? INS, I think. INS, okay. So, yeah. Well, the IRS he, is like the tax. I know. I was taxes? like. That wouldn't make any sense. Yeah, it's not the IRS. Now that you say that, it makes more sense. But uh, <laughs> it's this is a, this is a, mo- like, you need, this moment needs to happen in order for the plot to progress. So, basically, he wrote in a scene where this news reporter goes up to this woman and says, like, she'd basically be deported or something. Yeah. And I was like, Jesus, man, that's so fucked up that, that, like, they would even have this in this movie. I mean, it yeah. makes sense. Well, I mean, I it's, guess, be- it's better than the book reason, though. Because remember, in the book, she just spontaneously tells him who she is because she- reasons. Like, it's so stupid. Yeah. At least there's like a way that Gerber finds out here that we believe. Yeah. It's this asshole reporter, you know, trying to get the scoop. So Gruber finds out who McLean's wife is, takes her hostage, and John goes to find him. And he, on his way, realizes he's out of bullets for his machine gun. So he sees some Christmas tape and he tapes a pistol to his back and he goes in for the final showdown and plays out very similarly to how it does in the book. Okay, before we go on, I have to go back to that fight with Carl because I just remembered the line that I wanted to talk about at the beginning of this episode. (laughs) What's that Um, That I was waiting, I was waiting. Do you remember what what John McClane says to Carl as he's punching him on the staircase before he hangs him? No, I don't remember. Something about his brother and how it felt to fight him. He he talks about his brother squealed when he killed him. That's a little bit earlier. But on the staircase, he says, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to fucking cook you. And then I'm going to fucking eat you. (laughs) Which is so fucking good. That's awesome, man. He says it like you can barely hear him say it. It's as he's like punching him in the head. But it's just so like out of control crazy. Like, I just love it. Like, it just shows how. I'm going to listen for that next time I see it because I I do not. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to fucking cook you. And then I'm going to fucking eat you. (laughs) That's the last thing he says to him before he wraps the chain around his neck. That's so crazy. (laughs) The showdown happens and. Gruber is holding her hostage and he's like, he starts laughing or no, sorry. First, he's like, what was it that you said to McLean? Gruber says to McLean, what was it that you said? yippee ki motherfucker. And then motherfucker. He says it's so funny. Yeah. Like weird. The way weird he says accent. It. Uh, so I asked him when, uh, when, 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 when he first comes out here, he like rifle butts a terrorist, knocking him down. And the guy drops all these like bonds or whatever on the ground. That's another terrorist who lives, by the way, as far as I can tell, because he's not killed here. Yeah. He just gets rifle butted. So I assume that guy lives, and then I assume Theo lives later. Yeah. Um, but this, all, that scene where he yells, Hans, and he like comes out, and he's backlit, and you just see his like shadow essentially walking forward and like kind of limping, and, and, and there's like I think there's like sparks coming down behind him. Yeah. Like, I just feel like that's such a cool, iconic scene, too, for this character. It's so good. It's it's extremely iconic. And I think that's why they've like had the yippee Kaye. It's so like it's shown up in all the diehards. Everybody says it all the time. Um, it's such a great scene. So, and this is you know, he, he, it's been said before, but uh, his power increases the more damage he takes. So at this point, he's he's like near near death. So he's at his most powerful, of course. <laughs> yeah. So he uh, yells to his wife Holly, and she jumps out of the way a little bit, and then he shoots he shoots Hans, and he's like, "Happy trails, Hans!" and sh- shoots them both. Shoots them both one, quickly. One guy in the head, Two and he bullets. shoots Hans a couple times, and then he blows on the end of his gun. Yeah. Too. He does. So yeah, he Which, takes them uh, both out. Maybe he would have had time to to where it wouldn't have been quite so close with Holly there if he hadn't done that. <laughs> yeah, it was really close because I I thought about that this time because the way they sh- the way they cut it, it's like he has a second where he's like sitting there and then he like reacts like oh and she's like already like she would be like out the window already, and anyway. Yeah. 
she's hanging off and we talked about it in, a, in another episode but her watch is what the greed and and the token of it's her of, tie to this greed her company, tie to the, yeah. exactly so it's although there. this company isn't as bad as it is in the book right yeah like we get an idea that like it's just politics and like and nakatomi's even like you know you think it's it's you know we're actually going to help the region and we're going to build it we're going to bring in money and all this stuff so debatable on whether or not this building is or this you know company is actually evil whereas in the book i think it's more obvious that the company is like literally trafficking illegal arms i think right right so uh mclean's able to get the watch off of his wife and this is when hans falls and this this fall here is very iconic and oh, so good it, the fall actually i was reading that the fall is they were going to count to three and drop Alan Rickman, but they counted, they dropped him on two. So it was like genuine shock and surprise. And they used the first take. And also I'd be so pissed if I was Alan Rickman. <laughs> and also Alan Rickman. I'm a fucking that, actor. Let me act. You don't need to like trick me and make me think I'm going to die. Exactly. And it was a far fall. He had to fall like 40 feet onto an airbag. I was noticing that. Cause like he, like that's that scene where he drops, it goes on for so long. Yeah. Like, he drops a really far distance. Yeah, so he did that. They they did that to him, and Alan Rinkman said they were that he's like, it was smart of them because they were very careful to make sure that that was his last scene that he shot for the movie. So they totally <laughs> fucked him. He was dude. pissed after they, that. Yeah, I guarantee he, I would have been it. so angry. Yeah, so they used that take, and... Uh, well, at least he seems like he had a good... He had a good take on it and didn't completely hate him. <laughs> so yeah. I don't know. So this is the end of the movie here. Um, John comes down with his wife and they're they're walking down the steps and they're, he's like about to meet uh, Al in the flesh and Carl comes out of nowhere, zombie Carl, ghost Carl. He shows yep. up with a gun. Back from the grave. Back from the grave. And he starts, he's about to start shooting at everybody and then we get gunshots. Boom, boom, boom. He gets shot all over his body and he goes down and we get this really cool shot that I really wanted to mention where it's the Watch shot out, of the kids. gun. Oh yeah. Al's got his gun. <laughs> yeah. The shot of uh the shot of the gun, we see just the barrel of the gun and in, in focus mm-hmm. and then it it like racks focus to him. But yeah. the way that it kind of also tilts at the same time and just the reveal of him having, you know, we talked about it earlier, he like this is the first time he's actually able to to draw his gun. It doesn't hit Yeah, and then well Argyle comes before, out but... like a second later and he like turns to shoot Argyle and, and John's like, whoa, 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 this one's with me. Like yeah. showing that this guy is not to be trusted with a gun. <laughs> he's yeah. just going to shoot everything. He's ready to shoot everything. Children and women, doesn't matter. He's just going to shoot them. So watch out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm joking, I, but you know, still. <laughs> they jump into the they jump into the car, the limo, and Argyle takes them away and Christmas movie plays because it's now Christmas. Yeah. So uh, Holly doesn't fall to her death here like his daughter does in the movie. So that's a pretty big difference. Um, I mean, it makes for a completely different film if, if she dies at the end, right? Yeah. I mean, if she punches the reporter and it's it's a feel good ending for a Christmas movie. That's why this is a Christmas movie. If she died at the end, it wouldn't be a Christmas movie. He's reunited with his family. He's going to go spend Christmas with him. He's got his buddy Argyle who's still going to drive him in the limo after he's just went through all this shit. And he probably needs to be like interviewed by the cops because he he punched one of the terrorists himself. <laughs> Doesn't matter. He's just gonna drive off with John McClane in the back of his car. <laughs> his like busted up limousine. <laughs> yeah, like it's been in like a crazy wreck too. Hit and run wreck. Yeah, but it's yeah, like dragging um, its bumper. I think as he drives away. Which that's not legal to drive like that. <laughs> <laughs> They're gonna get him down the road. They'll they'll pull him over down the road. It's funny. This movie's so imperfect, and there's so many things you can put, make fun of and poke holes at. But it, like, it's still just so fun. Like, it's just such a fun movie to watch. Here at the end, I wanted to talk to you about an overall theme that I think this movie is at its heart is about, and see what you think about it. So, John McClane is a cop from New York. He is a down to earth, gritty, badass, no frills. He keeps looking at all the L.A. stuff. And raising his eyebrow at it because it's all, you know, you know, it's soft, right? It's soft L.A. It's 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 movies. It's uh, the glamorous, all that stuff. Right. So this movie at its heart is really about like East Coast versus West Coast. It's about glamour and Ritz and uh, softness and whatever you want to call all that versus like gritty New York hard boiled. Right. Yeah. And you take one character and you you've transposed him now and you've put him in this world he's not accustomed to. 
But so at its heart, like, it seems like it's trying to say something about that. Like, is it trying to say that 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 worldview is inherently better? I don't know. What do you what do you think of that? I feel like it has to do with I don't think he's necessarily trying to make a point of that. I, I think he more was using it as characteristics for his for the setting of his films. I'm not really sure which which way McTiernan was leaning on it, but it seemed like East Coast is like your everyman cop. Like he like we talked about before, he's an everyman. He does what he needs to do. He'll he like gets he's vulnerable. He gets hurt. All of these things. And it's not the idea of like the Hollywood action star that never gets shot, never gets hurt, never gets nothing really happens to them. So I don't know if it's so much an East. So it's more like, about the real West real thing. world versus Hollywood. Right. Like more of like a like, yeah, like a grounded. OK, I can see that now. Now, one side I, I could I could maybe argue a little bit more about it is that. So do you remember the scene where they're interviewing a um, psychologist on TV? Yeah. And that psychologist has written a book that's called like Hostage Terrorism Terrorist something. Terrorist yeah. Hostage or something, right? And it's about the relationship between the terrorist and the hostage and how they're like growing close and all this stuff, right? And they have this expert on and it's undercut by a scene where they they show Ellis corpse being dragged by the hostages and they're all screaming. So we're left as an audience to go, ah, it's all bullshit. This guy doesn't know what he's talking about. So that and then the same thing kind of happens with the FBI who show up and they're they have it. Oh, this is an A7 scenario and they have this like playbook and they're running it. But then like that's actually part of the plan. And Gruber knows this. Right. So there's a lot of like common knowledge being wrong. And like but like John knows the truth of the matter and he knows the real criminal and he he's the one who understands how it actually is. So what do you make of all that then? Does this movie even know what it's like? Does this movie, uh, is it aware of the things that it's like putting forth or not? Like, I, I don't know. I mean, I feel like it has to, you ha I don't think you do something like that unintentionally. Like, I feel like it was intentional. I just don't know where I lean. Like, yeah, like you're saying, like the, the known route isn't necessarily the one to take or something there where it's like, he, like the, this guy's written a book on it. He's obviously a professional. He's on TV about it. And yet he's completely wrong because Right. you just don't know how, how things are going to play out i don't and it's kind of making fun of that character right like where, where do we laugh at him like oh he's so wrong right he's out of touch right this it's like so if i'm being there's two ways i can look at it i can be a little bit critical and say that it's like it's it's taking elites and like trying to take them down and say oh this guy who studies it he's an academic and he doesn't know anything and it's kind of like dismissive of all that so that, i don't know if i like i feel like that's kind of a shitty thing to do because we we like this guy's right like the book like the things he's talking about do happen it's just not applicable to this situation so if i'm being generous what i instead say is that maybe this movie's trying to say every situation is unique and that you need to be able to adjust to what is act, like the unique situation and not just have a you know bureaucratic you know t you know textbook this is what we do every time and you know no wiggle room so maybe they're like i will i will be generous and grant that the movie's just trying to say like you you have to be able to adjust to every scenario because every scenario is different they're not all alike yeah i like that yeah i feel like he would want it to seem like unpredictability and the in this story specifically it's like everything that's going on it's just like john mcclain flying by the seat of his pants you know just doing what he needs to do to get by and to survive and he's like well trained and he's using common, he's got, he's kind of got a plan, but it's not like it ever works out how he thinks it's going to. And, and there are people who, in this movie, who are taking advantage of common knowledge. Like Gruber is, Gruber knows all this stuff and he's using it against him. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's I think it's a little bit about the danger of maybe if you, if everybody agrees that this is the way you handle a situation, like the person, the criminal knows it too and could use it against you right maybe it's like a cautionary tale yeah and i guess that's okay before we finish out here i wanted to ask you about the Die Hard franchise i i think we both are in agreement that it's uh taken some steps back in recent years are, have you seen all of the diehards yeah i may have uh, you know what i haven't seen the last one i haven't seen the christmas one or uh, they're all i mean a couple of them are christmas but the most recent one where he has like his son with him in like another country 
Did I did see not that see that one either because I heard it was terrible. Yeah, so did I. I mean, I just, I'm not really going to check it out probably. I mean, I, yeah. I will if it's on or something, but I'm sure I'm not going to be the biggest fan of it. But the one before that was Live Free or Die Hard, I think, and that one was fine. Yeah, it, it was it okay. Was, yeah, it is what it was. It was kind of a, like the modern So if we look back at it. the original trilogy, how would you rank this? I would say, I mean, I would just say one, two, three personally one two three yeah i think i go one three two um okay. i do like the second movie i kind of i think that's the one i need to see again because i think it's been a really long time um there's parts of die hard with a vengeance that i really really love and it's a lot of the like the interplay between simon giving these guys like things that they have to do and them running around like him you know puppeteering them and i find all that stuff really fascinating but then there is some stuff in three that like loses me and it gets a little bit too insane and well isn't die um, die with die hard with a vengeance is three and die hard die yeah, harder is two yep okay so just making sure so uh, die hard with a vengeance with, is the one, the with, one with samuel with jackson simon three, on the right? phone Samuel Die Hard with a Vengeance yeah. is the one where he's like telling him to do stuff and he has to like wear the sign in, yeah. the, in the Compton or wherever he was. That's three, yeah. Yeah. That one, yeah. I, I feel like that one was like, it definitely put a different spin on it and two was more of just like a more of the same, just on a plane. Yeah, it's interesting because I've, I've heard that two is based off of a, a novel by a different author. Um, so I'd be curious to look into that, you know, in case we decide we want to revisit this world at some point maybe a future christmas episode or something who knows yeah um because apparently two is also based off a novel cool all right man are you ready to put a bow on die hard our christmas project yeah let's do it it was a fun time i will just say off um just for for the record i feel like i enjoyed the the movie more than the book um yeah how about you same yeah the book yeah, was, was pretty good but the, the it, it wasn't better. like my favorite book that we've read or anything i'm glad that i have read it this is a this is another time where like common wisdom doesn't hold up because I feel like the common thing is for people to say like the book's always better, right. but you know as much as that's often true, here's an example where I don't think it's true. Yep. All right, so we've already talked about our special episode coming out, but make sure you get in questions for that. But I wanted to go ahead and let you know that the next actual book film project we are going to do is going to be a, a one episode combo where we're going to read the book where the wild things are. And then we're going to see that movie. Um, and then we're also going to watch a short little documentary about about the author, um, Maurice Sendek. And uh, then we'll talk about all three in one episode. That should be the first episode of the new year. So if you want to uh, refresh your memory, whether it's look at the, the kids book or go back and see that film or check it out if you haven't seen it yet, um, you'll be ready to go when we do that mo- when we do that movie. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. And also, if you wanted to reach us in any other ways, you can reach out on our social media accounts. We're on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. At Ink to Film on all three of those. Yeah, we'd also like to get feedback from you. At Ink to Film is where you can reach us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. And then if you wanted to reach us for feedback of our podcast or anything you wanted to say to us, um, you can reach us at Ink to Film at gmail.com. Yeah, and if you would like to help our podcast, you enjoyed this episode, would like to continue to hear us, Make sure you subscribe on whatever platform you use. And if you would, please, please, please leave us a rating or a review. A review like this one that comes to us from iTunes from uh, Cbro360, which we know is Colton from our friends over at the Watch, Review, Repeat podcast. And he says, well, I'm hooked. Really enjoyed the first episode. Wasn't sure how much I'd get out of the podcast given I hadn't read It by Stephen King, but Luke did a great job of guiding the discussion, even for newcomers, and James was a great was great to listen to from an outsider's perspective. Can't wait to hear the further commentary of the book and the new film when it's released. Keep up the great work, guys. You've got a regular subscriber here. P.S. As someone new to the podcast game, I hope we can collaborate in the future. And you've already appeared on their show, and yeah, I think that's we're going to continue to to keep in touch with those guys because we we enjoy their show as well. And yeah, thank you definitely. for that, Colton. Yeah, if you if you could just go over and check out their podcast, their watch, review, repeat, um, shoot us a sh- shoot them a message over on Twitter or Facebook or something, and tell them we sent you just for just to oh, keep yeah, that connectivity cool. going. Um, <laughs> so yeah, we wanted to say thank you to audible for our audible link if you wanted to get those 30 free days and one free credit you can use audibletrial.com forward slash ink to film and that would really help us out and we'd also like to thank chris hayes music for the use of our intro and outro music 
Absolutely. All right. Well, you know, happy holidays, Merry Christmas, whatever you celebrate. Hopefully you have a great time. See your family. Enjoy listening to this podcast in your downtime, maybe. Um, And we look forward to seeing you for our new episode, which will be out near the end of the year. Yeah. Looking forward to it, guys. Uh, Thank you again for listening. All right. I'm Luke. And I'm James. Yippee-ki-yay, motherfucker. (laughs) Ha <laughs> ha.